Okay, everybody, if you could find some seats. I want to welcome you to our first resident academic half day. This is our new project. This time is yours. It's all for your core education. It will include our Department of Medicine Education Conference at 8 o'clock each week. That's our DMEC, or Grand Rounds. Uh, we then have three hours of core lectures, and you guys will have an opportunity to take a break in between lectures and then come back in. And then at 12 o'clock, we have some special sessions. Uh, the fellows will be joining the residents a couple times a month, scholarship and quality and safety talks. The other times are administrative updates and your um, uh, resident town hall, where we'll all leave and you guys can get together and tell nasty stories about us or whatever you're going to do. And I'm very pleased that we could start off this uh, new program with one of our all-star teachers, Dr. Jay Shanker, and Dr. Pancho will introduce you. Good morning, everyone. Um, the first thing I would like to say is please turn off your pagers and um, uh, cell phones. Um, the first speaker on our first academic half day is Dr. Deopiran Jay Shankar. He's an associate professor um, in the Department of Internal Medicine Division of Oncology, and he's going to talk about medical oncology update on breast cancer. Good morning, everyone, and. Um, Welcome. Uh, it's my privilege to kick off the Department of Medicine uh, Education Conference Series. Uh, in keeping with what we have uh, brought from the Division of Oncology in the past, uh, we are going to talk about oncology for the internist. Today, uh, it's a medical oncology update, uh, and I'm going to be talking about breast cancer. We've uh, brought chronic leukemias for the internist. In the past, we've brought thrombosis and tumor uh, for the internist and then cancer screening in the past. We've also dealt with lung cancer, but breast cancer is a topic that we have not really uh, dealt with in, in, in total. What I'm going to try and do is focus on some of the updates, but if I were to give you just a rat -a tat sequence of the updates in breast cancer, it may or may not uh, make sense for the uh, entire audience here. So we will give you some backdrop of uh, where these updates come from and why these updates are there. So without further ado, these are our topics today. Breast cancer screening, who and when. Who is at high risk for breast cancer. Screening breast MRI, when to order, if at all. Who gets adjuvant chemotherapy and how much. Adjuvant endocrine therapy, tamoxifen, five or 10 years. Tamoxifen and SSRI interaction, something very important to the internist. Which one's the right one? And then finally, dual HER2 blockade has arrived and some newer drugs in breast cancer, just so that you're familiar with the names of these drugs and the mechanism of action. Most of these drugs are in the metastatic setting. So we'll start with a case scenario. A 38-year-old patient is in your office, concerned that her aunt, aged 66, was diagnosed with HER2-positive stage 3 invasive breast cancer. No history of breast cancer in the family, but a history of colorectal cancer at age 29 in a first cousin is noted. Which of the following recommendations is appropriate based on the current task force guidelines? And you note, we're going to deal with the task force guidelines here. I'll let you go through those uh, options uh, for a second. Uh, I'm not going to do an audience response, so we'll just go through the options. So basically, this is a screening question. And we've got four options there. And what we're testing is, would you do a mammogram starting at age 50 with or without BRCA testing? Or would you do an MRI starting at age 40 with or without BRCA testing? So the question's a 38-year-old, and she's under 40. She's obviously concerned with a history of breast cancer, but the breast cancer history is not a first-degree relative. This is an aunt, and the age of onset of breast cancer is 66. So the right answer is actually B, as per the task force guidelines, which is a biennial mammogram starting at age 50, but do not do BRCA testing. So let's get into the guidelines here. Why do we have screening for breast cancer? It's the commonest cancer in the world in women worldwide. The second most common cause for cancer death in the United States after lung cancer. These are some important numbers for you to keep in mind. The lifetime risk in the United States 
is 1 in 7 or 1 in 8. So we are somewhere between 12.5 and 14.5 percent lifetime risk for any person in the United States out there. And that is what we would call standard risk. And it's important to understand the concept of standard risk versus high risk. So the screening guidelines do not apply for patients who have a lifetime risk of breast cancer of over 20 percent. That is a high risk category and the screening guidelines don't apply there. We are talking about standard risk patients. And this patient that I gave in that scenario really had standard risk. And how do you come up with a high risk assessment of someone being over 20%? This is based on the fact that they may have tested positive for BRCA mutation, one or two, or they may be a very strong family history, which is not what we saw in this patient, or they have had a prior history of chest wall irradiation. Now, if you go back to that question, the one answer that could have been there, that is not there, is starting mammograms at age 40 and doing it every year, which is probably what most of us do in practice, but the task force uh, came up with some guidelines that said that you start uh, mammograms at age 50 and that you do it every other year. And so we'll talk about some of the task force guidelines here and about what the rest of the organizations are talking about. So this was the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendations that came out with much fanfare and furor a few years ago. There was debate raging across the country if this was accurate. So in a nutshell, this is a complicated slide, but in a nutshell, this is what they have. Between the age of 40 and 50, they basically said, do not screen. Granted, it's a grade C recommendation, meaning the data to support this was not extremely robust. And they actually said, start screening at age 50, and that you could possibly do it every two years, which is again against what the rest of the organizations recommend, which is basically to do it every year. So this is what we have, guidelines galore. And we have various societies, including my parent body, which is the American Society of Clinical Oncology. We have the NCCN guidelines, we have the American Cancer Society and the National Cancer Institute all weighing in. And basically, at this point in time, they would recommend starting screening at age 40 and we would probably do annual screening. So there's a dichotomy here. The task force recommendations is what usually shows up on the ABIM exams. And uh, that's, that's what you need to know from a board perspective, which is start screening at age 50 and maybe do it every two years. But in the real life, when you're out there practicing, you probably have to start screening at age 40 and you could do it every year. And so this question was just to highlight that you may have a patient concerned because of a family history, you really have to dissect the family history and dissect the other risk factors. Remember that the most important risk factor in breast cancer is age. This is SEER data that tells you that breast cancer peaks in women between the age of 65 and 75. And so when you take a lady who's 38, the incidence of breast cancer in that population is somewhat low. And your capacity to dent that incidence or make a difference based on screaming becomes even more modest. So this is where the guidelines brought their data out from, which is that if you take between the age of 40 and 50, the true positive rate with screening is 1.8 per thousand women screened. And that's as far as invasive breast cancers are concerned. So if that is the incidence of the disease, you can see how modest any intervention could be. Now that is not to say that you should not intervene. That is not to say that you should not screen. The real debate and question is, does screening make a difference? Yes, it makes a difference. How much? Probably somewhat modest at that age between 40 and 50. And at what cost? Probably at a significant cost. And how to balance that is what the guidelines are trying to attempt. What you try to come out with as a guidelines for a population, for a nation, for a community, can be quite different from what you will be practicing sitting in the office room talking to an individual patient. And, that, and that's where some of the debate is. As of now, the task force is reconvening to come up with new guidelines for the breast cancer screening. And over the next few months and possibly in the next year, you may see some new guidelines. The task force summary would be, do not screen before age 40 in the standard risk patient. Now, if you have a high risk patient, yes, you can screen before 40. But in the standard risk patient, do not screen before age 40. Discuss screening. They do not say do not screen, but they say at least discuss screening between 40 and 50. Routine screening starting at age 50 every one to two years. Possibly stop screening at age 75. Encourage breast awareness. And you may consider a clinical breast exam, maybe annually, starting at age 40. No matter what, these are screening guidelines in the completely asymptomatic patient. 
do not hesitate to examine and image the breast no matter what age if the clinical symptoms and signs warrant it. And that is an important caveat to remember there. So that's on a lighter note. This is what happens when you sit on a guideline committee and that's someone from the task force paying a price for those guidelines, I bet. Case scenario two, 43-year-old female patient is in your office for a routine physical. She is concerned about breast cancer. She has a first cousin who was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 46. The patient herself has undergone a total hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo oophorectomy for endometriosis three years ago. She was on a combination birth control pill for 12 years prior to that. You engage in a detailed discussion on breast cancer. Which of the following statements is incorrect? So this is basically talking about risk factors for breast cancer. That's what that question is all about. And so you've got four choices there. I'll let you read through that for a few seconds. Any takers? What might be the incorrect one? Just guess, fire away. I, I hear an A. Anything else? Okay, so A is the combination pill is riskier than estrogen alone. That is a correct statement. The combination pill is riskier. So that's not the right answer there. Alcohol intake and a high BMI or obesity are risk factors, and yes, they are risk factors. Bilateral oophorectomy is protective against breast cancer, and that is true. So the incorrect answer is uh, statement D, which is breast density is not a risk factor. It is actually a risk factor. And that's one reason why I put that question out there, because you're going to see more and more data about breast density. You're going to have radio, uh, mammographers and radiologists documenting and giving you reports on mammograms based on the density, and you're going to have to figure out what to do with those reports. So here's a snapshot on the risk factors in breast cancer. We all know BRCA1 and 2 mutations have a significantly high relative risk here. Here is family history of breast cancer, and this is what gets a little confusing. You've got BRCA mutations, which are heredofamilial cancers. 90% of breast cancer is sporadic. 10% is heredofamilial. And BRCA1 and 2 mutations are typical of the heredofamilial cancers. But you will find most breast cancer patients will give you a family history of breast cancer. So this is how it breaks down. If you have a first degree relative, the risk ratio is 1.5 to 2. If you have two relatives, you've got a risk ratio of 3 and so on as you go with the more number of relatives with a history of breast cancer. These patients have a family history of breast cancer, but it's not very strong. The gene is not very penetrant. We don't know what these genes are. And so uh, that's a little different from heredofamilial breast cancers. And being an internist out there getting a history from patients, you need to understand this. Patients will come to you running saying, there is a strong family history in my, in, in my family. And, and, and I've seen Angelina Jolie have bilateral mastectomies. I believe I need an MRI, and maybe I ought to have bi bilateral mastectomies. And that's really not the case for most of those patients, because there is a family history, but it's not really a history of heredofamilial breast cancer. Here are some other risk factors. We talked about radiation out there, very high relative risk, and so on and so forth. Some of these hormonal factors are well known. What I want to bring uh, attention to is right here at the bottom. Breast density has a relative risk of five, and atypical ductal or lobular hyperplasia has a relative risk of four. So this is very important to keep in mind, and more about this in a minute. So here are some risk assessment tools. You can go online. These are some wonderful tools. The Gale model out there, you just have to plug in some numbers and it'll give you a risk ratio. The Claus model, BRCA Pro, which is a very, very user-friendly um, uh, software out there uh, online, and the Tizer Cusick model. So personal factors that increase risk, this is how you're gonna assess when this patient comes to you and talks about screening, should I, should I not? How do you plug that in? based on the fact, uh, what is their age? That is the commonest risk factor. If they have a prior history of invasive or in situ carcinoma. Here are some personal factors. We've talked about some of these. This is well known. We've been through this in med school about reproductive history and the fact come into play. And then we talked about these two factors which are somewhat new and we have to start paying attention to because they actually have a higher relative risk ratio than the well-established reproductive risk factors mainly breast density and atypical hyperplasia. So is breast density a risk factor for breast cancer development? And the answer is yes. Is that enough to get some screening? We'll talk about that in the next question. Some of the personal factors that decrease risk are an oophorectomy, some of these agents. These agents, such as tamoxifen and anastrozole, are well known to you in the treatment of breast cancer, in the adjuvant setting and in the metastatic setting. 
But what I'm bringing forth is that these agents now have data that they can actually prevent breast cancer, prophylaxis of breast cancer. These are agents that are being used. Tamoxifen, raloxifene, or Avista being used for osteoporosis in the internist community. Anastrozole, which is an aromatase inhibitor, and exomistane, another aromatase inhibitor, are well established as preventive measures. Exercise is also well known to decrease breast cancer. So any discussion of breast cancer would be incomplete if we actually didn't talk about benign breast disease. I worked as an internist for many years when I ordered a breast biopsy, and I, I would anxiously wait on that report that would come back to my desk, and it was a pathology report. I'd look at it and say, negative for malignancy. Aha, I'm done, and I'd put that report away. Well, not so fast. There's more to it than just saying negative for malignancy. Because you have to realize that benign breast disease could be non-proliferative disease, it could be proliferative disease without atypia, but more importantly, it could be atypical hyperplasia. So here's a very elegant series, it's a retrospective, a 25-year series by Hartman and all published from the Mayo Clinic. 9,000 biopsies which came back as benign breast disease. More than half of them were in patients less than 50. And of that, about 126, almost 10% uh, of them developed breast cancer over the subsequent 10 or 50 years. Why? Because there was patients with atypical hyperplasia tucked in, in that breast disease category that you're going to have to pay attention to. Because for whatever reason, you ordered a breast biopsy. Either there was palpatory findings or mammographic findings that brought up a red flag. And now you have atypical hyperplasia. You're going, you're going to have to follow these patients a little more closely. And that's the take-home message there. Here are some familial factors. We talked about personal factors that increase risk. Here are some familial factors that increase risk, and these are well known, and I'll take you through this. If you're already predisposed to heterofamilial breast cancer based on lab data and testing, BRCA1 or 2, P53 mutation, P10 mutation. If you have a, a relative who has a history of two breast cancers, that certainly brings up a red flag. Two or more family members with breast cancer on the same side of the family. One or more family member with ovarian cancer. And this is probably one of the most important, and which is why I've highlighted it, which is if the age of onset is less than 45 in a first or second degree relative, that carries a lot of weight. So if you have a patient giving you a history of someone who was 62 in the family on one side and 66 on the other side with a history of breast cancer, yes, that's important to me up to a point. And if they tell me I have a cousin who's not even a first degree relative, who's 28 and diagnosed with breast cancer, you better sit up and watch there. You, you've got to start putting them into the Gale model probe model. Male breast cancer brings up a red flag. And then if you have a patient or a family member with breast cancer and any one of these other cancers, that's a red flag again. So risk stratification in a patient who has not been diagnosed with breast cancer. These are patients who are there routinely seeing you in practice. How would you do it? There are two different ways of looking at it. Here's the Gale model looking at the individual patient's risk factors, which is age, age at menarche, age at first childbirth, number of first degree relatives, number of breast biopsies, atypical hyperplasia, and race. We've talked about this. People are familiar with this. It's an online tool. Just go open it up, plug in the numbers on that given patient in your office, and it'll give you it'll out a number. And the magic number is 1.7%. If the risk factor, if the, or if the risk is more than 1.7% over the next five years, it'll give you a five-year risk and a lifetime risk. But if you're over 1.7% over the next five years, you can make a case for prophylaxis with either tamoxifen or another agent. So that's the Gale model based on personal risk factors. You can also do the same based on family risk factors, and we talked about that to some extent. And here's a BRCA Pro, which is, again, a very user-friendly online tool, and that is specifically looking at your lifetime risk. It's also plugging in the family history, and you can see these are the various uh, uh, factors that are taken into on that software. If the risk is over 20%, then you start looking. This model is primarily to see what are the chances for that patient having a BRCA mutation. Because you'll have patients talking about breast MRIs, prophylactic mastectomy, concerned about it running in the family. What are they asking you? They're basically asking you, do I have BRCA? And before you run the test, this is something you ought to be doing. Because if this comes back low, you really don't need to be sending the test. You can reassure them saying, here's a software which is a very good and accurate software. And you can tell them that your risk based on these, uh, based on that questionnaire is fairly low and you don't have to send the blood test off. Case scenario three, 44 year old lady is in your office to discuss a recent mammogram. She feels well, the mammogram is unremarkable. Her mammogram report is BIRAD category two with mention of benign calcifications 
dense breasts. Here we go. Her, young, her younger sister is a Hodgkin's disease survivor and has annual breast MRIs for screening. Her paternal aunt and maternal grandmother had breast cancer in the 60s. The patient is keen on you ordering a breast MRI for her. Which of the following is an appropriate indication in her? So this is a breast MRI screening question. Now we've got a history of a 44-year-old lady, dense breast, so there's several things that we talked about earlier. Those are your options. Why would you order a breast MRI is the question. Is it because there's a family history of Hodgkin's disease? Is it because she has dense breasts? Because there's a family history of breast cancer or none of the above? Any takers? Dense breasts, okay, and I kind of led you to that, and I'm sorry. Yes, dense breasts is a, his, a risk factor for breast cancer development, but however, it is not enough to order a breast MRI just based on that. So here are some indications for the breast MRI. The slam dunk indications are if you have BRCA mutations, known BRCA mutations. The next is probably the most important. If you have a first degree relative who's a BRCA carrier and your patient has not been tested, that's still good enough for you to do a breast MRI, that's fine or if you have a more than 20% lifetime risk, and we've talked about that. By consensus, we also believe that patients who've had chest wall irradiation, and classically those are Hodgkin survivors, and that's why I threw in that sister with, who's a Hodgkin survivor. And then some uh, rare syndromes like the Leifromini syndrome and Cowden syndrome, yes, they will qualify for a breast MRI. This is important to remember. Women with a standard risk for breast cancer, less than 15%, remember we talked about the lifetime risk as 12.5 to 14.5, those patients, there's no role for a breast MRI as screening. Remember, the operative word is screening. Here is where it gets a little gray. You probably won't be able to get a screening breast MRI for these reasons. We don't get a breast MRI even in our own patients who've got a personal history of breast cancer. No, to screen them, we still do a mammogram. We don't do an MRI. So we're talking about screening, and for screening, none of these, including dense breasts, will get you in a breast MRI. That's kind of soft and gray. You have a patient, she's young, she's concerned. You do a mammogram and it comes back as dense breast, uh, which is heterogeneously dense. And the mammographer now says, I see some calcification. I'm a little uncomfortable. I need a breast MRI. You can get a breast MRI. But across the board, if you just say, you've got dense breast, I think I need a breast MRI to screen you, that would be inappropriate. That would be an overuse of resources. So this is something that you're going to see in your offices all the time. It gets a little confusing, and that's one reason why I thought I'd spend some time talking about breast density and breast So heterofamilial mutations, BRCA1, it's a tumor suppressor gene on chromosome 17. We have a slew of 500 such mutations which have been known, and every day we see some variant mutations, the significance of which is unknown. The breast cancer lifetime risk is 50 to 85 percent. Early onset breast cancer is an issue. Second breast cancers, which is why we would do offer a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy. And ovarian cancer risk is about 15 to 45 percent. There is a risk for some other malignancy, not as high as in BRCA2. BRCA2 is a tumor suppressor gene on chromosome 13. 300 odd mutations have been uh, reported. It's autosomal dominant in its penetrance also. Breast cancer risk is 50 to 85 percent. Male breast cancer is a problem here. Ovarian cancer risk is 10 to 20 percent. And other malignancies are well reported with BRCA2 mutations. Prostate cancer, gastric cancer, pancreatic cancer, bladder cancer. So what would you do once you have defined them as high risk? Number one, you can order or offer a bilateral mastectomy. And the obvious uh, criteria or reasons you would do it is if they have BRCA1 or 2 mutations, if they have prior chest wall radiation or if they have a very, very compelling family history despite being BRCA negative. And that's a soft one, so I'd be careful offering bilateral mastectomies there. A bilateral salping or is certainly feasible and would reduce risk. And then there's a list of medications, and we've talked about some of these. Tamoxifen for the pre- or postmenopausal lady. Tamoxifen and astrazole and eximistane for the postmenopausal lady. Raloxifene, uh, much better tolerated than tamoxifen but some recent data indicating that the efficacy is not as good as So case scenario four, we're now gonna switch gears. I took some time to go over the risk factors and the screening, which is of huge relevance for the internist community. We're now going to go into the treatment paradigms and you don't need to know the details, but you really need to know the overarching concepts as such. So here we are, 47 year old female, noted to have an abnormal screening mammogram, but no palpable lump, which see in the United States these days. Workup confirmed an invasive ductal carcinoma. She elects to undergo a lumpectomy and her final pathology report reveals a single focus of 1.8 centimeters 
generalized invasive ductal carcinoma. Margins are negative. Two central nodes negative for metastatic carcinoma. The Nottingham grade is 2. ER 51 to 100% positive, which is strongly positive. PR is 11 to 50% positive, and the HER2 is she wishes to be aggressive and is leaning towards chemotherapy. What would you advise? She's 47, obviously in shock with this diagnosis of breast cancer. So she wants chemotherapy. What would you do? Concur with her chemotherapy decision. Counsel against chemotherapy in her case. Order the Oncotype DX test on the tumor tissue or order a chemotherapy sensitivity panel on the tumor tissue. Thoughts? The panel, okay, very good. There's, the, there's a thought there, and they've explored that for a while in oncology. Understand other cancers. Any other takers? Get the oncotype, okay, very good. Here's how my oncology fellows would dissect this. This is what we look for in a pathology report. These are the, what we call breast cancer prognostic, the spokes of the wheel, as I call it. The grade of the tumor, the tumor size, the nodal status, hormone receptor status, the HER2 status, all of it has a role to play in predicting chance of relapse. And that's really what you're doing when you come to see me uh, for a decision on adjuvant chemotherapy. I am trying to predict what is your risk for relapse, and then I'm trying to impact that by trying to give you chemotherapy or not give you chemotherapy. So the patient in the question is the prototypical patient that we now have some answers for, for which we did not have answers 10 years ago. Small size tumor for us, 1.8 centimeters, under 2 centimeters in size. ER strongly positive, HER2 negative, node negative. This is where there was a dichotomy between the oncologists here in North America and our colleagues across the pond in Europe. She would have been treated with chemotherapy 10 years ago here in the United States. And our friends across the Atlantic would have laughed at us and said, you oncologists in North America are cowboys. We in turn would turn around and look at them and say, you're a therapeutic nihilist because you don't want to use chemotherapy. The question is who was right and who was wrong, and the answer, as always, is in the middle. We, the, we were both wrong and we were both right. The true risk of relapse in that scenario, which is a very frequent scenario, is about 10 percent. One in 10 patients would relapse in that scenario. The problem is we all know that when they relapse, the vast majority of breast cancer relapses are metastatic with distant disease and incurable, and that was enough to worry us into treating them with chemotherapy. And not so in, in, uh, in Europe, where they would say for the vast majority, 90% of them do not need to be exposed to chemotherapy, and hence they would not have got chemotherapy. And so the oncology opinion on the two sides of the Atlantic never did meet, and the answer was never clear till we had a test called the Oncotype DX test, which is a 21 gene signature that helps differentiate that. Before we get to the Oncotype DX, here are a few things that I'm going to run through uh, somewhat quickly. This was Safner et al. At the, uh, in the JCO in 1996 trying to explain what I was trying to explain to you here, which is what is the risk of relapse in that patient who has negative margins and a tumor that has been resected. That's your overall relapse rate, about 20% in the early breast cancer patients, and it drops to less than 10% by year five. Unfortunately, that, that never plateaus, uh, but the risk does go down. You can break down this risk of relapse based on ER status. Clearly, ER negative breast cancers have a higher risk of relapse. It's interesting, something we debate with our oncology fellows, which is that at the five-year mark, the lady with the ER negative breast cancer, who actually has high-risk breast cancer, is better off at the five-year mark. If she's alive and well at that point, the risk of relapse is lower than the ER positive breast cancer patient. So we dissected this in numerous ways, nodal status, quite intuitively, the patients with four or more nodes at a much higher relapse risk compared to someone who did not have nodes positive. Patients who had a larger tumor, more than three centimeters, had a much higher relapse risk than someone who had a less than one centimeter tumor. So we put that into that grid, but we were still not sure how to pick out that one out of ten patients who really needed it. And so we overtreated the vast majority of patients uh, in the United States and in North America with that scenario to try and make sure that we negate the 10 percent relapse risk came out with this test, which is called the Oncotype DX test, and that's an update, not, not necessarily in the last two years, but over the last six or seven years, this is now mainstream in oncology. This is a 16-gene signature of high-risk gene, including HER2 gene, you can see out here. This is an RT-PCR test, and we've got five reference genes. Based on this, you actually will get an Oncotype DX score. The report is a low score, an intermediate score, or a high score, 
with phenomenal predictive values here. 6% chance of metastatic disease over 10 years, 14% chance or a 30% chance, and that's what you're trying to pull out, that one in 10 patient, that patient who has a small breast cancer, node negative, ER positive, where you want to say you probably don't need chemotherapy, but if you apply the Oncotype DX and she has a high risk score, yes, you will give her chemotherapy. This is how this report actually comes to your office. This is what the paper report would look like, and this is basically a snapshot at the 10 mark. You're looking at the recurrence uh, risk itself across the score. So the score of 18 and lower is low risk. 18 to 30 is intermediate risk, and 30 is high risk score. So this has phenomenally changed how we approach early stage breast cancer as an oncologist. Case scenario number five. If you were to take the same patient who had a 1.8 centimeter breast cancer tumor, ER positive, was initially told node negative, and let's say pathology goes back, and this does not really happen too often, but let's say pathology goes back on re-review, says, wait a minute, I actually have one out of two central nodes that are positive, okay? And it's, a, it's four millimeters in size. To us in oncology, four millimeters are macrometer. That's a clear-cut uh, metastasis. There's no question about a metastasis. We're not talking about a micrometer. We're not talking about IHC-positive disease. What would you do next? Whether you're whether you would give chemotherapy or not is not the question. We would give chemotherapy. Once you're node positive in the United States, we would give chemotherapy. Now, that might change five years down the line. But right now, if you're node positive and have breast cancer, we would offer chemotherapy for you. For the most part, uh, and if, as long as you're fit and you're under 70, we would offer chemotherapy. The question here really is, you have a sentinel node that is positive. What else would you do for local treatment? Number one, would you offer a completion axillary dissection? along with radiation. Number two, would you do an oncotype DX on the axillary tissue to determine whether you need axillary dissection? Would you do an axillary, or can you omit an axillary dissection as long as radiation is given? Or would you do an axillary dissection only if they are triple negative or HER2 positive? Any takers? So basically the framework of that question is you've got node positive disease. Do you go in and grab the rest of the nodes or not? A, someone says, complete the axillary dissection. And uh, you know, you, you, we should probably say that would be the right answer for the most part, and that would have been the right answer three years ago. But today, we have some data. So before we get to that data, here are some old paradigms about the central lymph node. It was introduced to decrease lymphedema. The negative predictive value of a central node is 94 to 96%. If the SLN is positive, not too long ago, we felt an ALND, or an axillary lymph node dissection, was mandated, and that changed, okay? Why was it mandated? Because the chances of having further axillary involvement is 48 to 50% once your SLN is positive. So how can we now turn the clock back and say, no, you don't need an ALND? That came from what we call the Z trial. It's still only one trial out there, but the data is reasonably convincing that our surgeons have bought into it. There were 800-odd patients, and they had T1 and T2 lesions, which means anything under five centimeters in size. These were patients who had a lumpectomy. So right off the bat, this entire Z trial data is applicable only to the lumpectomy candidates. If you have a mastectomy, we really wouldn't apply this trial. But if you were to have a lumpectomy, what would happen? You would have radiation. And so the question is, if you have only one or two central nodes positive, you're anyway going to get whole breast radiation. The question was, could we direct the beam and sterilize the axilla with radiation, knowing that we actually give chemotherapy anyway because you're node positive? Between radiation and chemotherapy, can we do what an axillary lymph node dissection would do in the past more? And the answer there was yes. So these are the curves showing no difference whether you had an ALND or did not have an ALND on the Z trial. And they actually came out saying, even if you have one or two central nodes positive, you do not have to have an axillary lymph node dissection. It's fairly technical, a lot of input from the surgeon, a lot of other risk factors have to be taken into account. The reason I'm even bringing this up, and it seems like something that's very technical, why should an internist know this? Because patients will come to you, they trust you, they've known you for 20 years, and they're gonna come and ask you, do I do it, do I not do it? And remember, it's, it's not a slam dunk. It's not as though you don't need an ALND automatically. A lot of us still have some concerns saying, if you have high risk disease, there is some value in still doing an ALND followed by radiation and followed by chemotherapy. I do want you to be aware that yes, an ALND can be omitted in the right, uh, right setting. Yes. Yes, but...
don't mean right right so if your confidence intervals statistically if the confidence intervals are not good enough and if your p value is where it is in this case which is 0.14 really non inferior so and the study was adequately yes it was with 800 patients it, it was adequately powered and so uh, the data was reason, reasonably robust Sometimes we don't necessarily go just by the statistical data because there's a trend one way or the other and you can look at this. There was really no trend on this one. So it did come back equal, but a lot of caveats. They have to be lumpectomy patients. They have to be smaller size tumors. Uh, would probably say ones who don't have other high risk characteristics. In that category, can we forego an ALND? Maybe yes. Good, good question. All right, it was one of my favorite slides when I discussed breast cancer for the residents and fellows. Guess who? Captain of the first 11-member American football team scored the first touchdown in the Yale Eaton football game. Invented surgical gloves to protect his life, so he's not a medical oncologist. He was also known as Herr Professor. That's Halstead. So no discussion of breast cancer can be complete without discussing Halstead. And there he is. Uh, internship at Bellevue, trained in Germany and Austria, known for the first blood transfusion uh, and he did this on his sister. She had postpartum hemorrhage. And this is 1881, before Landsteiner and before we had ABO blood typing in groups. The first gallbladder surgery on his mother, obviously known for the Halstead radical mastectomy, invented the surgical gloves as well as uh, a technique for inguinal hernia repair. The Halsteadian surgery was very disfiguring and mutilating. It was called the extended radical mastectomy where literally the pectoral girdle to the front of the chest. The patient lost the shoulder, the pectoralis major, the entire pectoral girdle went down. Halstead believed that the more you took out, the better your chances for cure. This is over 100 year old data, 120, 130 years ago, he was seeing patients with breast cancer who were late in their presentation. And so he did radical and more radical surgery in an effort to get ahead because he thought this was a surgical cancer with a surgical cure, which it is a surgical cancer but it's a systemic disease. Um, and so his data, which was first presented in New Orleans back then, showed that local recurrences were lower, the more extensive was the surgery. The lesser known fact there, that it was a case series of about 35 to 40 patients. The lesser known fact there is that every one of those 35 to 40 patients which had, who had lower local recurrences eventually died of metastatic disease. Uh, so this is just something to keep in mind. So where we went from there, from extended radical mastectomy to a radical mastectomy to a mastectomy as good as a radical mastectomy, that's the NSABP before, and then now we have a lumpectomy plus radiation being as good as a modified radical mastectomy. This is a concept that has to be understood, which is that more is not necessarily better in breast cancer, and that this was a surgeon who taught us this 100 years later, that was Bernie Fisher and his so these are the landmark uh, intergroup trials, the NSABP6, showing you the curves here. This is mastectomy versus lumpectomy versus lumpectomy and radiation. No difference between mastectomy, lumpectomy, and radiation put together, whether it's disease-free survival, distant disease-free survival, or overall survival. You do some, see some lagging when you do lumpectomy alone, which is why you would not do lumpectomy alone without radiation. And there's a caveat again, except for the patient over 70 uh, you could get away with lumpectomy alone there. So that's B6. There's some more data on B6. Remember, this is data that was mature by the late 90s. Bernie Fisher showed us that if you were node positive with breast cancer, you had a 50% relapse risk um, back in the late 80s. Okay, by 1989, Bernie Fisher's data was out. And today, we tell our patients with node positive breast cancer that they have a 94 to 96% cure rate with early node positive breast cancer based on the B28 data. So we have gone from a 50% relapse risk to about a 6 8% relapse risk, thanks to everything else that's being done in the adjuvant uh, field. What do we do in the adjuvant field? Chemotherapy, endocrine treatment, um, and targeted treatment. So the next few slides, I'm gonna just give you some backdrop. I'm gonna run through it. I'm not gonna give you the details, but I will spend some time on this one slide. Any discussion about adjuvant therapy would be incomplete without us talking about the EBCTCG data, which is the Early Breast Cancer Trialist Consortium Group, published in May of 2005 in The Lancet. So it's not new data, but it's phenomenally powered because this is data from 1985 to 2000, 
194 randomized trials without confounding issues were taken in. Six meta-analyses. What are these numbers? 8,000, 14,000, 14,000, 15,000, 33,000, 18,000, 8,000. These are the number of patients in some of these meta-analyses. And they were powered enough to show that chemotherapy decreased mortality by 38% in the young patient and 20% in the older patient, and that endocrine treatment brought down mortality by 31%. These are relative re reductions in mortality. The two, the chemotherapy and endocrine treatment, are additive. And so I want you to take this point home. If you have patients who come in, they are sold into and bought into chemotherapy, and they say, I'll do it. And when the time comes to take tamoxifen after a year or two, it's like, nah, leave me alone. I don't like these side effects. You've got to emphasize to them that the benefit of uh, endocrine treatment and tamoxifen is as much as the benefit with chemotherapy. So this is how the curves came out. Beautifully done work uh, with this uh, analysis. This is based on recurrence. This is based on mortality. This is the younger patient, the older patient. Clearly, recurrence risks can be impacted more than mortality risks. And we do more um, of an impact on the younger patient compared to the older patient. This is node negative versus node positive. Clearly, we make a bigger dent in the node positive patient. ER poor versus ER positive. So what you take home here is this is the younger patient, this is the older patient. So if you have an older patient who is ER positive, the capacity for chemotherapy to reduce mortality may be somewhat modest. And that's the take home message that you want out there. They can still be treated and they do need to be treated. We fight for every 5% in medical oncology, but you have to be honest about what is the impact of these treatments. And therefore, if they have uh, toxicity issues, we keep a very low threshold to pull back. So that brings us to the New England Journal of Medicine in 1976. That's the Milan group, Bonadonna. That's what kicked off adjuvant chemotherapy in breast cancer. This is the beginning, as I tell my fellows. This is the curve for patients with one to three lymph nodes positive, the difference with chemotherapy versus no chemotherapy. This is four or more nodes positive. Subsequently, so this is a sequencing of where we are today. It comes from the fact that we started with CMF, which was cytoxin, methotrexate, and 5-FU. Subsequent intergroup trials showed that adriamycin and cytoxin was just as good as the three. So a two-drug regimen was just as good as a three-drug regimen. The two-drug for three months is as good as three drugs for six months. We have adjuvant therapy with a third drug today, which is called a taxane, paclitaxel, or docetaxel, taxotir, taxol. You may have heard of these names. So some of the, the updates on this is that we used to administer this drug every three weeks. We figured out that with this uh, landmark paper by Sperano et al, that a weekly paclitaxel um, regimen was just as effective and probably more efficacious with less toxicity. This is how chemotherapy is now administered. Again, this is from Larry Norton and his group. This is not new, 2003. What we call dose-dense chemotherapy, giving adriamycin and cytoxin every three weeks versus every two weeks. And every two weeks works better than every three weeks. It's just that it became national standards and guidelines in the last year or two. So it was always available, dose-dense AC. It was considered a somewhat fancy regimen. You applied it only to the younger, fitter, healthier patient. And we now actually find that you can take an older patient and give them this chemotherapy regimen every two weeks with growth factor support with far less infection risk. So adjuvant therapy in breast cancer, we went from two drugs, methotrexate 5-FU, to three drugs, CMF, as the gold standard for 12 months. Then CMF went for six months. Uh, we found AC four cycles over three months was just as effective. And with the dose dense, we are down to AC four cycles two months. So we went from adjuvant therapy for 12 months down to adjuvant therapy for two months. Along the way, the intergroup trials also showed that endocrine treatment is effective. And here's something patients sometimes come and ask you. I have a 0.9 centimeter tumor, a 0.6 centimeter tumor. Do I need to take tamoxifen? You probably don't need chemotherapy. Should I be taking tamoxifen? And the answer is yes. There are trials that have looked at under one centimeter tumors. And that's the effect of tamoxifen. We talked about the chemotherapy effect, and this is a sizable effect on recurrence and mortality. We know it works on pre- and postmenopausal patients, node positive and node negative patients. The toxicity is what bothers all of us, because this is for at least five years. And this is why the internist needs to know tamoxifen inside out, because these patients are going to be in your office, as well as in my office, when they're taking tamoxifen. And the side effects are vasomotor symptoms, uh, mood swings, VTE risk, venous thromboembolism risk, as well as endometrial cancer. This is new. We believed that the standard treatment of tamoxifen for five years was adequate. 
there were other trials that looked at 10 years of tamoxifen that came back negative. And then now we have two updates from two large clinical trials, one called the ATOM trial and the other called the ATLAS trial. Both of them have corroborated that there is an advantage to giving tamoxifen for 10 years as opposed to five years. And that's the separation of your curves, and you can see the p-value is fairly significant out there. So 10 years of tamoxifen will probably become the standard going forward. As of now, we have not accepted 10 years of tamoxifen for all patients. There are some caveats if you're young, if you're premenopausal, if you're premenopausal or still premenopausal at the end of five years of tamoxifen, if you have high-risk disease, multiple nodes positive, I would certainly consider 10 years of tamoxifen. I have not applied 10 years of tamoxifen to all my patients. If someone is 67, node negative, a small tumor, strongly ER positive, maybe we can still get by with five years. Why? Because the absolute quantum of improvement is only 4%. So you're trading off some efficacy against toxicity. That's the extension trial, 7,000 patients. After five years, they randomized them to stop versus continue, and those are the numbers, 15% decrease in recurrence and 25% decrease in mortality. One last thing about tamoxifen, there's that connection with SSRIs. Tamoxifen is metabolized to its active metabolite endoxifen by the CYP2D6 pathway. There are several SSRI medications that are potent inhibitors of CYP2D6. Therefore, if you were to use fluoxetine, and I am going to use some trade names here just for the benefit of the trainees, that's Prozac, Paroxetine, that's Paxil, Sertraline, that is Zoloft, Bupropion, that's spelled wrong there, which is Wellbutrin. All these are potent inhibitors, which means they would decrease your endoxifen level, which means they would increase your relapse risk. So this is, this is an absolute no-no, and you re really never want a patient or somebody uh, representing the patient coming back with this data to, to show you. So if you were to use, and we do use, SSRI medications with tamoxifen, these are the drugs which are less potent inhibitors, which are feasible. Citalopram, that's Alexa, S-citalopram, that's Lexapro, and Venlafaxin, which is Effexa. We have fairly good experience with these drugs, especially since we use them for vasomotor hot flashes, and they work and the risk of relapse is not necessarily higher. This is um, a chromatogram showing you the concentration of endoxifen, the active metabolite, before this patient started Paxil and four weeks after they started Paxil, just to give you an idea of what we actually do to the body. Brings us to the last adjuvant drug, trastuzumab. 20% of breast cancer overexpresses the gene encoding for this cell surface molecule, HER2. Remember. HER2 is just a group of the epidermal growth factor receptors. You have to show that the test is positive, either on IHC or FISH. Do leave it to the oncologist and the pathologist to determine who's positive or negative because we have now a bunch of gray zones for us to wade our way through. Well known to be efficacious, 50% decrease in recurrence, four large clinical trials, 11,000 patients. Cardiotoxicity is the rate-limiting side effect, and this is a decrease in ejection fraction. And the current recommendations in the adjuvant setting are for one year of trastuzumab. That's the mechanism of action. So HER2 is human epidermal growth factor receptor. So HER2 belongs to the family of EGFR receptors. There's HER1, HER3, and HER4. It's a transmembrane receptor. There's an extracellular domain and an intracellular domain. And so when you use trastuzumab, you have to remember there are two, uh, two sites to this. There's the antigen binding site. It's a, a humanized uh, monoclonal antibody. So the antigen binding site will bind to subdomain four in the extracellular region. But then you have an FC domain that will actually hook up to the immune effector cell. And there is actually antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity that plays a role in cell death. And that's how trastuzumab works. And so wonderful data on trastuzumab. This was actually a joint uh, analysis of two large intergroup trials, one from Canada and one from the United States, and basically showing across all age groups, whether you're under 40 or over 60, whether nodes are negative or nodes are positive, this is the difference. Anywhere from 15 to 30% improvement um, uh, and benefit with trastuzumab, whether you're ER positive or ER negative, no matter what the tumor size, and this is interesting. Even if you have low-grade tumors, tumor biologies that are low, you're still eking out a good 10% survival advantage there. Which brings us then to the question, if trastuzumab is cardiotoxic, and we all know anthracyclines are cardiotoxic, what are we doing to the heart? Are we going to just make mulch of the heart, trying to give them adjuvant chemotherapy? And so they came up with an alternative, um, a regimen called TCH, 
which does not have a anthracycline. And this was a clinical trial called the BCIRG006, which reported its interim results back in 2008, 2009, again with much fanfare, which showed that the TCH was probably more efficacious. As we saw later data and mature data, which you always have to wait for, the two are about the same. So the TCH is not any better necessarily than the standard, the standard being AC followed by Taxol and Trastuzumab. TCH is not necessarily better, but if it's just as good, and this is a snapshot of what the left ventricular ejection fraction looks like 12 months into treatment. This is the left ventricular ejection fraction with TCH, and that's the LVEF with anthracycline and trastuzumab. So there is an improvement in the EF if you were to avoid an anthracycline. So we do have an anthracycline sparing option in HER2 positive breast cancer. So that's what breast cancer treatment is today, local treatment, adjuvant treatment, there's chemotherapy, there's endocrine treatment, and then there's targeted treatment. I'll finish with three new drugs that you need to be aware of just to be uh, just know the names of these drugs and where they are applied. Pertuzumab, a new monoclonal antibody against HER2, attaches itself to a different subdomain, and therefore there's comprehensive blockading of the HER2 signaling and probably better anti-tumor effect. This is what preclinical data told us, and this is a, a well-controlled randomized trial showing a six-month disease-free interval. Six months does not sound very impressive to us in oncology in the metastatic setting in patients who have already been pre-treated, pre it's huge. Because you can see with the control, the median survival is 12 months, and this is 18 months. There's a 50% improvement in the uh, progression-free survival. So this is now first-line treatment, and this is now standard of care, and according to guidelines, a category one recommendation that you use dual HER2 blockade, not one or the other. So that's a new concept, and that's an update that you need to be aware of. They will be taking trastuzumab and pertuzumab in combination with the chemotherapy. We do have overall survival benefit. The overall survival curves are not as impressive as the progression-free survival curves, not because the drug's not working, but because there's um, a crossover by the time you do an overall survival data. Another drug, and very exciting drug to keep in mind, is something called TDM1, or trastuzumab m -tansine. Forget the fact that these are tongue twisters. Look at the concept. This is a new class of drugs that we're going to see a slew of these drugs in oncology, in breast cancer, in lymphoma, and possibly in, in other realms of medicine. This is what is called as an antibody drug conjugate. So this is a cartoon, thanks to Genentech here. This is a HER2 receptor. We've talked about the transmembrane receptor. This is what trastuzumab, the pink stuff is, the, is trastuzumab, the molecule trastuzumab. And this yellow structure is the microtubule agent. That's the chemotherapy agent. So you administer the antibody drug conjugate. It attaches itself because of HER2 signaling to the appropriate uh, subdomain. And then it gets endocytosed, and the chemotherapy drug is then released to uh, affect the microtubule uh, and downstream signaling. And therefore, toxicity should be a whole lot less because you don't have an anti-microtubule agent floating around in the bloodstream. It's probably just intracellular. So that's TDM1. And do we have phase three data? Sure enough, we do. That's the Amelia study. These are advanced. This is not upfront metastatic setting. These are upfront. Uh, these are advanced breast cancer patients, heavily pretreated, who've already received a taxane and a trastuzumab. And this would have been the standard, lapatinib and capecitabine. That's what they would have got an oral HER2 drug and an oral chemotherapy agent. Instead of that, you just give them TDM1, an IV drug today, and you can see the difference in the curves. That's the Emilia study. This is the overall survival data on that. So these are the HER2 blockers. Extracellular, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, TDM1. Intracellular, these are the small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors, lapatinib, niratinib, afatinib. They all affect downstream signaling here. One last drug, which is not a HER2 agent that you just need to keep in mind. It's a new class of drug called halichondrin class. It comes from the marine sponge. It's called eribulin. It's a microtubule agent. Most microtubule agents affect the shortening phase of the microtubule, and this seems to affect the growth phase of the microtubule, and therefore seems to have less neuropathy and may overcome taxane resistance. Phase three trial called the EMBRACE trial, clearly showing an improvement, again, in heavily pretreated patients. The improvement is modest, but that's how we win the, or at least get ahead in the war against breast cancer. There has not been a single blockbuster drug necessarily from 1985 through to now. The advancements have been 5% at a time. 
And that's how we've advanced from a 50% relapse rate down to an 8% relapse rate in early stage breast cancer. So I talk to my fellows and I frequently tell them that uh, often the medical oncologist is like a fiddler on the roof and we're not even the main fiddle, especially in breast cancer where the surgeon is the main fiddle. This is a surgical cancer and the cure comes from surgery. But we can impact those cure rates by being the second fiddle and we're a pretty decent second, second fiddle, I believe. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, I think we're, yes, Dr. Geraci. The question uh, is, uh, if you were to use a CYP2D6 drug that would potently inhibit tamoxifen, can we overcome that by increasing the dose of tamoxifen? And I don't believe that has been looked at. Uh, I don't know the final answer to that, but the 20 milligram dosage of tamoxifen uh, came to us about 28, 30 years ago, and that's been the standard dose that they've run with. And I don't believe, uh, I'm sure there's probably some preclinical data, but there's no clinical study that has looked at increasing the dose of tamoxifen. The minute they found that there was a psychotropic drug that got in the way of an anti-cancer drug, the, the leaning has been to back off on the psychotropic drug. Yes, Dr. Chakrabarty. So the question is, if the tumor size is small um, and then the adjuvant setting, uh, can, you do, can you drop anthracycline and pursue just Herceptin alone? Uh, and in the adjuvant setting, uh, Herceptin has still uh, been used in combination with the chemotherapy agent. So the smaller the tumor size, there are some cutoffs as to at some point where we may opt not to treat them with the HER2 agent at all. We do have older patients with smaller tumors and where you don't want to get into full-fledged chemotherapy. And there is clinical trial data where you could use a single chemotherapy agent and a HER2 blocker without having to take on the, the entire panoply of drugs. Very good, thank you so much.